All right, well, thank you all for agreeing to do this this yes. evening. I brought, gonna... I brought, so I can call a lifeline. No, okay? there's no lifelines tonight. <laughs> there's no Google. <laughs> this is just all y'all. <laughs> All right, well, I thought we would just have a little fun tonight. And so to get started, we're going to play a little game. So you're going to need that. Oh All right. Oh, my goodness. Now, you got to try to hide your answers. Here's a dry erase marker. So we're going to play. Oh, here's, here's a, um, an eraser because you'll need that. We are going to play a little game called Him or Her. Okay? Okay. So I'm going to ask you a question. Now, y'all don't look. Don't cheat. Okay. Um, don't look at what the other's writing. So I'm going to ask you a question, and you're going to write either him or her, depending on who you think answers this question. The 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 fits the question. Fits the question. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Okay. So don't show until I ask you. Who said I love you first, him or her? <laughs> I mean, 54 years, y'all. It's been a long time. <laughs> Are we supposed to number these? No, no. No, show me. Turn them oh, around I'm and show to me. Show yeah. you? Oh, okay. See what you said. So you can write big. Him. Oh, I need to write big. Him. All right. <laughs> you match. Of course, in my generation, you didn't tell them first. <laughs> All right. So how many dates in before you said, I love you, Dad? Oh, are we supposed to do that one? No, no. Oh. I'm sorry, sorry. Just, just a question. <laughs> oh, it was on the first date. On, oh. <laughs> All right, y'all. This just got serious. All right. Well, we'll get uh, to that in just a minute. We'll get to that in just a minute. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. That better in a little yeah, while. Yeah, in just a minute. Okay. <coughs> Who is a better driver, him or her? Our first disagreement. <laughs> All right, turn them around. Let's see. We got her and we got him. <laughs> I don't get lost. <laughs> All right, here's another one. Who has the messiest closet? <sighs> That's easy. <laughs> Confession is good for the soul. All right, let's see those answers. Her. <laughs> All right. Actually, my dad's closet is very clean and neat. I won't, I'll refrain from saying anything about my mother's closet. Because he doesn't have to do anything else around the house. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh <laughs> she didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Um, who spends the most money? Him or her? Oh. Well, I don't I'm know. actually interested to see that. That's questionable, <laughs> really. Her. <laughs> all right. I don't know. With all those race cars, I didn't know. Dad well, that's that's awesome. not our money. That's oh. my money. Oh, that's your money. That all doesn't right. Come, doesn't come from our salaries or anything. That comes from my personal money. All right. Well, we'll have to hear a little bit more oh, about yes. that in a minute. Um, all right. Who gives the best directions? The best uh, what? Directions. For what? For like getting to somewhere. Okay. Him or her? I'm saying this, but I don't believe it. <laughs> Him. <laughs> I just right. know what he'll say. <laughs> okay, just a couple more. <clears throat> Who is more likely to be running late? Hmm. No, you're not. <laughs> All right. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, my parents have three dogs, but they have one very special dog named Fergie. And Fergie is 98% human and 2% dog. Yes. Um, so this is a much debated question in the household. Who does Fergie love most, him or her? 
I don't believe this, but I think it's true. <laughs> what did you say? Oh, wait, you're changing your answer? <laughs> you don't want to be sleeping with Fergie tonight. Is that the, is that the problem? <laughs> Her question <laughs> What did you say? I said him. <laughs> All right. Final question on him or her. Who is usually right? It depends on the subject. No. Who is usually, usually right? <laughs> All right. Let's see it. <laughs> what Right. Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> oh, don't right. y'all love this? I got Kleenex, so if I want to cry. Well, that was just a little fun, just to kind of break the ice. So I'll take these back. So, all right. Well, I know a lot of people out there know the story of how you met and fell in love. It's a very unique story. Um, I really think it should be a lifetime movie, just personally. Um, but we don't want to spend a ton of time on this, so why don't you just summarize, Mom, real quick, um, how you and Dad met and fell in love. I'll do really quick. Okay. Because it really takes an hour. Okay. Well, we don't okay. have that long. I so. know. Okay. I know. Um, he is six years older than me, um, so though we lived in the same town, we, uh, he went to one church, one of the uh, Assembly of God churches there, and my dad passed to the other. And though our families, uh, in fact, his dad uh, held meetings in my dad's church, and the tent that he had the, the uh, vision in was my dad's tent, though because of the six years, we never were, you know, with each other as far as and the youth well, groups he and stuff. Was your, okay, that's Ed it. was interim pastor for yes. your day. Yes, we're not going to tell all this details. I know, so, but that's, that starts it out in 1945. Okay, so anyway, <clears throat> when I was a senior in high school, uh, I worked for the newspaper office and my responsibilities were to write all the wedding engagement stories. And I wrote an engagement story of Kenneth W. Hagen to, I don't remember what the girl's name was. But anyway, I wrote his engagement story to another girl. So then he goes in the military. He was actually in the military at that time. He goes in the military. I go finding a husband at Bible school. Knew I was called to, to ministry, so I go to Bible school. Thought I found a husband, engaged uh, to be married, and the guy broke uh, the engagement. Uh, in the summer, after my first year, I thought, why go back? There's nobody else there, so I'm not going to go back. So, <laughs> Not to, like, get an education or no, anything? No, no. I was there just to, to find a husband. All right, got it, got it. Yeah. I mean, college is good for some things. Yeah. Okay. Well, the reason you were there, because you wanted you going in, wanted to go into ministry, and you That's were looking right. for I mean, you know, I'd looked over the crop, and that was the only one, and he broke it up, so... <laughs> So anyway, to be a little bit more serious, you know, at that time I said, God, you know, I've tried to help you um, plan my life, and so I'm going to let you plan it. So it was in, uh, the, in January of, of 65 that um, my mother and daddy, it had to be by God uh, because they really never fellowshiped with his pastors. I mean, they weren't in the same circles. Uh, they went to a, a prayer conference together the ladies, and they drove together. And so the ladies were in the back seat and said, and so as they're talking, it was about a six hour drive. Uh, she said to my mother, well, what's Lynette doing now? And you know, she kind of told her what she was doing. And he, she said, well, is she dating anyone? And mother said, no. And so she said, well, do you remember Kenneth? She called him Kenneth Wayne Hagen. And mother said, yes. And so she said, well, you know, he was, he's in the military. And he's over in Taiwan, and he was engaged to be married, and the girl broke the engagement. And he's really lonely, so um, doesn't get any letters. So I thought Lynette might want to write him. So that began the story. So I decided, why not? I was bored, why not? So <laughs> I've always been busy. So I went and I got, um, perfume stationery. Uh, it was the perfume that I wore. 
And I, I always liked to write, so I got the stationery and I wrote a 10 page letter. <laughs> and, and so I thought, oh man, I better uh, put a picture in because he, you know, I'm sure if he's ever seen me, I was in the sixth grade when he saw me and I've kind of changed. And um, so, Pick it up. okay, so I put the picture in and I sent the letter. All right. And I had, I worked uh, with top secret stuff in a comm center and I had come, you come off of the mid shift and you go, you, there's four groups of us and you come off your mid shift and you go on 72 hour break and then you start it all over again. And so I had just come off the mid shift and I got to the hostel and I was changing out of my uniform because the only time I wore that uniform was when I went to that comm center. I didn't know that wear it any other time. They didn't want me to. And so a guy come and knock on my door and he said, they want you up at the comm center. I said, you got a letter. And I said, I never get any mail. What are you talking about? And he said, well, listen, he said, this one, this one is perfumed and it's stinking up the comm center. <laughs> so I changed clothes and went up there. And, and of course there was a letter and, and I opened it. And when I opened it up, the picture fell out. Well, you guys that have been in the military know what happened. Them guys picked it up and it, it, it was from there. Who is this? And all kinds of stuff. And uh, so uh, we started writing. I wrote her back and then she wrote me back and I wrote her back. And, and uh, that's the way it went for, from then till August of 65, yes, whenever I came so, home. And so about May, or really the first of June, I knew that, I just really knew that I was falling in love with this guy. You know, when you write, you just don't, you're not seeing the person, so you just keep on writing, whatever you feel. And I, the, I mean, the, the mushiest, I, I guess, we that ever got was, we both said, you know, we might be falling in love with each other. Because and when you're writing, you just write about your life and what you want to do and what you plan to do. And if you're talking to a person, you can see their face. If they're not going over good, you back off of it. But when you're writing, you just keep writing, you know. And so we had, in those months, we had learned a whole lot about one another as we were writing yes. about ourselves <clears throat> and what we do and what our plans were. And, and so the big day came in August and he got out of the service and he, uh, he called and said, you know, my family's having kind of a party for me, so I don't know when I'll be able to see you, but we'll, you know, it'll be a, probably maybe about nine o'clock at night and I think my earrings are doing this. And, um, and, so, um, and so I said, okay, so I'm, you know, putting on what I think I was gonna wear. And as time went on, I changed three times. And um, so finally the, the time came that the doorbell rang. At that particular time, I had moved back home uh, with my parents. So there was a storm door, like a screen door, and there was a wooden door. So the doorbell rang and my, my brother, uh, who, who was like 10 at the time, started running toward the door and I said, Gary, Leave it alone. I'm I heard you holler, Gary, do not go to the door. <laughs> so now I'm thinking, okay, you know, what's going to happen when I open this door? I mean, I'm seeing him for the first time. And I, like I said, I knew that the moment that I saw him, oh, by the way, he never sent me a picture. So I was doing this by faith. I guess that was my first... <laughs> Well, you had that picture they showed there of me and my uniform. You pushed, I didn't. You didn't send it to you me. You published it in the paper. Well, yeah, I did that, but, you know, that was several years. Anyway, and uh, so, but I had I'd known the minute I saw him, I would know whether I was in love or not. Let me see. And so, as I left the comm center with all the guys, and we were all, everybody was going, I, I told him, I said, listen. Because somebody said, what about that girl? And I said, if she's what I think she is, I'll marry her when I get away. If I see her, I'll know. And so that's, that's where we were. In fact, both of our mothers, my mom, we found out later, had told my dad and her mom had told her dad that when, they, when, when he gets home, these two will get together. They are, they, somehow moms know stuff. That, so anyway, I opened the door, but... 
I never got to see him. All right, you want me to take it? I was wondering the same thing. What am I going to do? What am I going to say? And she opened the door and I saw her. This wasn't planned. I didn't think about it. I just grabbed her and kissed her. <laughs> right there. I just grabbed her and wow. And that's why it should be a movie. <laughs> And so that was August and then... That was August. Uh, we talked all night. He asked me to marry him that night. <laughs> well, you don't waste any time, do you, Dad? Well, we had been communicating. We knew what we wanted. I'm 26 years old. And I had been the proverbial best man and groomsman because when I graduated from high school in 58, you graduated in, in May, you got married in June and that was it. And the same thing when she graduated it was still that way. And so I was ready and when I saw her and we talked that night as we, we, we sat and talked all night long about, about what we wanted in life and what we wanted out of life and about, and if you've been in our marriage family class, we talked about the things that we tell y'all to talk about. And when it's said and done, I asked her to marry me and she said yes. But the, you want to know the second thing I said? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I had been in a relationship that was a very controlling relationship. With that other guy. With the other guy. <laughs> and so I had made up my mind after that because it, it was, a, um, yeah, it was tried, quite a traumatic thing. I would made up my mind that um, when I did enter into a relationship, it was going to be a relationship that I didn't have to hide anything I you know I could be myself you didn't have to dress the way I didn't have to dress the way that this person wanted me to dress I didn't have to have the color of hair that they wanted me to have etc cetera, etc cetera. that's how bad it was and uh, so because I wasn't a person that really you know talked I mean I'm not a straightforward person so this took a lot for me to do this but I determined I was going to do it in the next relationship so after I said yes this is what I said, but I want to let you know that I'm going to wear my hair the way I want to wear my hair. And you said, I'm going to wear the clothes I, that, are, yeah. that look good on me. And he looked at me like, what on earth is wrong with you? <laughs> but my typical response, you know me, I said, I don't care, it's your hair. <laughs> that's exactly what I said. So that's how we began. And so then you were married just, what, four months later? Well, we were supposed, we wanted to get married. On Valentine's. On Valentine's Day in, 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 in uh, 66. 66. But uh, Sis and, and Buddy, my brother-in-law, it's gone to be with the Lord, they were music directors at a church in Minneapolis and they wouldn't let them off to come except at Christmas time. So that's, so that's why we got married December the 30th. December the 30th. All 1965. Right. All right. Well, thank you for sharing your story. Um, hope y'all enjoyed that. <laughs> so let's kind of just dive right in here. Um, so, you know, y'all's courtship was, you know, long distance, you know, didn't date a long time um, went before you got married. So in those f first few years of marriage, uh, what surprised you the most about each other? Do you know? <laughs> um, well, we didn't have a lot of surprises because we came from similar backgrounds. Uh, I guess probably the thing that I had to get used to uh, was his family, uh, their communication system was different than from mine uh, because um, we didn't talk a lot. You know, we didn't really ever have any um, fights or anything. We just didn't talk. And, just uh, internalized. Internalized. We internalized everything. Uh, whereas his family, oh my goodness, they talked about everything and they yelled, talked loud. Oh, and, we just talk loud. And so... If that were to have happened in my family, I would have felt like you were upset and because we didn't, we didn't talk loud, we didn't yell. So I guess, and then the other thing that I had to get used to was my family was not a real um, um, what affectionate. You, affectionate family. And with his family, I mean, you, uh, you, we didn't, in our family, unless we were going on a long trip, that's the only time we embraced. 
But with her, his family, every time you saw them, you embraced, you kissed, you did all of, you know, all of these things. And so, well, what about you, dad? Oh, I don't know. I had to, <coughs> I had to get used to her not talking a whole lot. <laughs> How could I? You talk all the time. When, you know, but, uh, I guess the, the, the thing I remember is that when she walked in the door, her shoes come off and that's where they stayed. And so I, uh, I had to get, if, if, if it bothered me too much, I just pick them up and throw them in her closet. <laughs> and like the other day, she was getting ready to leave the house. And you can see it. It never changes. Right? Said, okay. where, she says, where's my shoes? And I said, well, they're in there at the breakfast bar where you were sitting doing work. They're right there underneath the bar stove. That's where they're at. <laughs> so I guess it goes to show you that people really don't change, right? No. no. I mean, no. when you marry somebody. <clears throat> you have to adapt. Right. You have yeah. to like what they are. And not let it frustrate you. Goodness, if those things frustrated us, we'd be frustrated all of our life. Well, right. when it comes, another thing, their, their family liked uh, a lot of seasoning in their food. And, Spicy. And I didn't. I, I mean, I didn't like a lot of salt and pepper and, and hot sauce and all that. Still don't. But uh, so I had to get used, used to, or she had to get used to fixing it. And then so I could eat it. And then she had had hers on her plate. Yes. All right. Well. Let's move on. So, you know, in marriage, one of um, the big topics is, you know, responsibilities because, you know, just in your daily life, there's a lot of responsibilities in keeping a home and finances and chores and laundry and cooking. And so how did you, you all decide to divide up the responsibilities in marriage and kind of tell us like who does what? You want to talk? Well, I, uh, she was working in, and she's working in a, where she worked with budgeting and finances and stuff. And I was like most guys, I just live from paycheck to paycheck. If I run out of money, I just go over to grandma's house or over my aunt's or uncle's house or over my cousin's house, and, you know, get something to eat. Any of you guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> And so I said, well, you're good with the finances and you're going to have to take care of the house and food and kids and so forth. So you just handle the finances. She's been taking care of them for 54 years. I don't know how much money we have in the bank. I don't know who she writes checks to. I don't know anything about the finances. I just, I, she does it all. So that's part of it. And then when it comes to Housework. I had watched my dad help, always help my mom around the house, so I didn't, I didn't mind sweeping or helping clean up the kitchen and stuff like that. So that's what I, I did. I did. Because, because I've always worked, even when the children were young. Well, uh, he would always help with the kids. We would uh, take on Saturday. I was working, and he would uh, always take the kids, and um, you know feed them, get them ready. And well, that was when Craig was. Craig was little. little. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, he's always been good about sharing um, the chores. Yeah. So has there ever been any conflict when it comes to the sharing of responsibilities? No. I, I would not say so. I will, now I will say that his dad was a great example, much better example than my dad would have been because my dad never helped with any of the chores at home. And so I, I was thankful for that example that his dad was. So you talked about that, you know, um, you both had wonderful examples of, you know, a marriage and a, and a home life really. Uh, but I know for a, a lot of people out in the audience, that's not the case. Um, they may have come from a single parent home or maybe a home where there was a lot of strife and just not great patterns in marriage. So what, what advice would you give um, to those individuals that did not grow up with seeing a wonderful marriage and their parents? Um, what advice would you give to them in going into marriage and, and how to really work with things and communicate with each other? Well, I think the, the first thing is doing things together uh, because it, it, 
when people just go their separate ways, and I, and I see that a lot in, um, in the generation that we're in. Uh, they, uh, I see that um, couples, they go on separate vacations, the, and I just, I don't think that's good. I think you need to do things to, together. We always um, had our family time. Uh, we always had our connecting time. One, one thing that we've always done is before we go to sleep every night, we say, I love you and kiss each other. Right. And in the morning, it's the, first thing, the first thing we do when, uh, I mean, we may not always get up at the same time, but we always do that. And I think that's a, it's important, you know, to say, I love you uh, a lot. I, I know one person told me, well, my husband hasn't told me I love you in like 10 years. Well, that's terrible. You need, and, and I think, you know, holding hands, these kind of things, it's just a connection that you really, really need. Yeah, well, when people need to uh, not look at their situation, if it was bad, they need to find a couple that's older or yes. more mature, that has a good relationship, watch them. And you know, if you see us walking in the mall, you'll see me holding her hand, walking down the mall. We, we did everything together. We never, we never made a major purchase of furniture, car, major purchase at all without each of us talking about the situation together. I never bought a suit. I never bought anything unless I conferred with her first. I never, I never, and I'll say this, you can't operate a bank account with two people operating out of it if you don't, if you don't communicate because one person spends money here and another one spends money here, especially with this new system. One of you is at an ATM over here and one over here. Next thing you know, you're gonna be, you're gonna be in trouble. So you share, it, it's a matter of sharing everything. And uh, so you do, and you work together. You, you, uh, you don't, you don't try to be where somebody is that's been married 20 years. You work, you work it one step at a time. And uh, like we, for what six years or more, six years we used uh, furniture now that they would call eclectic because. Our, our coffee table and end tables was early American. Our couch was a red contemporary. contemporary couch we got from her sister, the tables we got from mom. And uh, that's, our whole house was that way. But we made a point, we we're not gonna spend a bunch of money on buying cheap furniture. We're gonna wait until we can buy solid furniture. And some of that furniture is has been used by uh, grandkids and, and family, uh, other family members over the years because it was good furniture. It done, good furniture last. That's right. So you talked a little bit um, about finances. Yes. So, you know, I mean, obviously we've heard some stories that, you know, used to not have very much and, you know, the Lord has blessed you financially along the way but I know that that's not just by chance. So what are some of those core financial values that you instituted in your marriage, those principles that you've lived by? Well, the first option was you always tithe. You always pay your tithes. You no always, matter what, you yes. pay your tithes. And um, years ago, right after we got married, I figured the bills and um, I realized that month that more money was needing to go out than was coming in. And it's, of course, the enemy will always tell you the way. And so he said, well, you know, why don't you just not pay your tithes this month and, catch, and, up next and month. catch up next month? Sound like a good plan, doesn't it? Sound like you're not really cheating God. And, uh, but I'm so thankful for the training and the teaching that I had from my parents. My parents, every time I would get money, they said, okay, you gotta pay your tithes. You gotta pay your tithes. And so the next thought was, uh-uh, I can't do that. And so I was so mad at the devil for even tempting me that I just said, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. 
And I said to God, I started, you know, this is how I pray. I said, God, okay, I'm making out the first check is going to be my tithe check because we would get paid once a month. I I'm, was, and she wasn't working. And I wasn't working, no. And I was, I was an associate pastor full time and <laughs> I wasn't making hardly anything. <laughs> and so I said, I'm going to, I'm going to make out the tithes first. And then I said to God, God, I have placed you first. I have done what you've said. Now I expect for my, the rest of my bills to be paid this month. At the end of the month, there was no extra money that, that, we, came know in, of. that we know of that came in. <clears throat> the bills were as normal, but as I wrote out those checks at the end of the month, no hot checks. I had written out all of our bills. Our bills had been paid and we had $5 left in our bank account. And I, we, to this day, we, we don't, don't know, know how it happened. Yeah, but I do believe because we place God first and that's the thing that we've always done. And as you do that, you know, God is obligated yeah, to bless I, you. As growing up, Papa, my, my mom's, my grandpa, my mom's dad, He'd give me 50 cents. Man, I'd run and I'd say, how much ties? And dad'd say a nickel. And I'd get that nickel and I could hardly wait for Sunday morning to put it in. And I've always paid my ties. And if you want, if you want God to bless you financially, you have to work according to his rules and regulations. One of the things he said is that you pay your ties. You bring your ties and you give offerings as you can. So that's what we've always done. Now, in the natural. And we have, in the natural, yeah, I started to say, we've been very, very frugal and we never spend money that we can't afford to spend and we never put money on a credit card if we can't afford to pay it at the end of the month. And in the natural, there were years that um, I would buy groceries for the whole month. I would buy bread and put it in the freezer, I would put things in the freezer that we could. And so the only time I would go to the store is if we needed milk. And you don't really realize how much money that you spend just going to the store. At the end of the month, did I really, did we really want to eat what we had left? Not really. But on the other hand, you know, we were, that was our budget and we had to do that. There were times that we never even bought any, any clothes, anything for several years. You just live within your means. And, and we, we, did not, uh, we did not go out to eat. No. We, uh, and like you said. Didn't it, go through the Starbucks drive-through. Didn't no. go through the Starbucks drive-through, no. To this day, I could go and, and, and when I'm in a hotel on, a, on Crusades, I could go and get something out of that drink machine. I won't do it because I can, I can go to the grocery store, not a 7-Eleven or a Quick Trip or one of those. I can go to a normal grocery store and I can buy a whole six pack of Coke for what it costs me just to buy two Cokes. And I'm just still that way. I did, we just. Okay, let me tell a little funny. This is okay. how much this way that they are. So I have been traveling with my mother before and I guess she thinks that they don't sell sugar or half and half for coffee in any other place but here because she will bring a cooler in the car with half and half for coffee. Um, she brings her own coffee maker, by the way, to all hotels. And um, It's a percolator. Yes, not a percolator. A, it's, and my own cups. It, she brings her own cups, but she will literally bring a container of sugar from home. And I say, Mom, just go to the store and buy sugar. Well, why would I do that? I mean, I have this whole big thing at home. So they really are very, very frugal. So We are. We anyways. are. All right. So our time's getting short here. I know. Ah, all right. Okay. Um, let me ask a question that um, really, I, think, I believe a lot of marriages, um, this causes a lot of disagreements. By the way, um, do you wanna share maybe just real quick, uh, just a topic of maybe what your biggest disagreement, disagreement or argument has been in 54 years? Inquiring minds wanna know. Uh, well, actually, you I know. Can't, I can't remember. <laughs> Well, actually, we were taught to forgive and forget. No, but, and so we really, I mean, I, there's never been a time that we didn't talk for, you know, weeks or even days or hours. Uh, we would uh, express our 
you know, our, that we were upset about something. It wasn't probably a really argument, but I will tell you. Okay. Um, yeah, my actions. Uh, when we were, this was when we were actually associated at West Texas and he was taking flying lessons. And I didn't want him to take flying lessons anyway, because I, you know, in my testimony about flying, I just didn't want to take flying lessons. And uh, so there were two incidents that happened. One incident he told me that, because I like for people to eat my food when it's hot, okay? And so he was, I was at home and he said, well, I'll be home at such and such you know, time. So I had it all planned, I had it, you know, so then he didn't get home. It, that was before microwaves, y'all. And uh, so it was 30 minutes and everything was ready and he wasn't home. It was an hour and he wasn't home. So the longer it got, the matter I got. So guess what I did? I just, I ate and I threw the rest of the food away. You didn't save any for him? I did not save any for him. <laughs> so uh, he learned. <laughs> And one other thing about that is that when he was flying and they were doing, uh, it was a solo, I guess. Okay, let me tell you. Okay. <laughs> Both of these were whenever I was taking flying lessons. And yes. Of course, if you're up in the air, you, you, you can't, you can't, you got to get back to the airport. So. Now and, remember, I value money and I'm very frugal. Okay. So just remember that. And to this day. When she calls you to the table, you better get there. Used to, the kids and I would sit there. And in fact, one time Craig said, well, let's watch mama eat while our food cools off so we can eat. Cause that's, she eats hers hot. But anyway, I didn't, I didn't know I was gonna solo and we land, doing some touch and go landings. And I, he said, stop here. And I stopped and he got out right there at the, at the hangar. Well, runway down to the hangar. He said, okay, take it around. and. So I did, I did my solo. But what I didn't know is that when you do your solo flight, that the instructor and the other guys, they cut the back of your shirt out and ride on it, you know. And he had his best shirt. And I had my best shirt that I owned on and uh, that didn't go over to me. <laughs> so what about that? Like, you know, even now when you, when you, when you have arguments, you have disagreements, maybe there's a decision to be made and you think you should do this. You think you should do that. And you just kind of come to an impasse. What do you do? How do you get past that? Well, I don't, there's think hardly anything now that, that we do, we but some people do. And so I, you have to learn in which we have learned and probably that's why we don't have any now is because to be flexible. I mean, I, I would get um, years ago upset because it's like um, he would do things at the last minute, you know, like, um, like oh, several years ago, it was winter Bible seminar and he says to me at 6.45 and we're supposed to be here, where is that suitcase that my dad used to carry all of his books in? Well, here I'm having to crawl and try to find this suitcase. It's up in an attic somewhere and we gotta be in church in 15 minutes. Most people would get upset about it. Well, you know what? I just learned that's the way he is. He's not gonna change. So I can either be frustrated all my life or I can just accept it. And the same thing with, with, with him. I mean, there's things that I'm sure, I know. I'm, no, they're not, I'm so perfect. But anyway. <laughs> no, she, she plans everything. Everything has to be planned. There is no extemporaneous nothing. Bum, 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 bum. Okay. Yes, there is. So I learned, <laughs> I learned to work with it. But yes. the, the biggest thing is, is too many people are too rigid. Yes. You've got to learn not to be rigid and you've got to learn when, it, when it's important to dig your heels in and when you just say, okay, whatever, and go on down the road. Because you are going to come to, and you know, and then... Like one guy said, pick your battlefields. Yes. Is it worth it? That's the number one question I ask myself. Is it worth it? Is it worth uh, the consequences or whatever's going to happen? And 
usually I end up saying, that's nah, not worth it, so forget it. So that's just, that's it. The, the key word to get along is being flexible yes. and not rigid. That's right. Give and take. And holding your tongue and not saying things sometimes, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> you learn to, to be assertive with your words and not aggressive. And any time, and, and those that have been in class, you know that. So now any time that you know, we uh, start being not assertive with our words, we just say to each other, you're being aggressive. And you know what? Humor is the best thing. Um, laugh about it instead of getting mad about it. And instead of crying about it, just laugh about it. All right. Two more questions. I'm going right. to take about five minutes longer. Well, we can right? go over time. All right. We can right. go over time. Is it all right we go over time? Okay. Um, now, something that hadn't been said in here, the spiritual side is always there. And it's an understood, so I, I, I haven't even mentioned it because that's an understood. You're going you're gonna to live in line with the Word of God, what the Word of God says, and the Word of God says that the husband is to love his wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Gave himself. That's, that's the key right there. If you're going you're gonna to love your wife like Christ loved the church, then you give yourself. It's not all about you. It's, it's for them. It's her. So, you know, if we're going to go on the spiritual side, but that's understood. And most people in here, I figure, understood that. So we didn't even need to talk about that. Well, in bringing that up, let me just say one thing. So, because one of the, uh, I hear this from ladies all the time. Oh, well, my husband won't pray with me. I, I want us to pray together. Well, you know what? The only time that we pray together is when we're needing something that we're agreeing together on. And uh, so we pray about that. But, but we have our own personal prayer time. Pers I mean, I might be praying about him, you know? And I don't want him to hear that. <laughs> And so, just because you don't pray together for, you know, hours every day, doesn't mean that you don't have uh, a godly relationship. Uh, and so, we have our own private right. time with our prayer. Now, we, when the kids were home, we read the Bible every yes, day. Yes, prayed. In fact, the kids, I know that my kids have read the Bible through five times, because I read it with them five times. Yes. As they were growing up. But... As far as us sitting together and reading the Bible, we don't. Well, I, I've got my Bible reading and I read and she has hers. But, and then if we need to pray together about situations or things that will come together, but, but mostly we have our own independent uh, time with God. So, so we just busted your bur a bubble, I know. Yeah, we just busted <laughs> a lot of bubbles, but that's... But if you, if, you, if you want to do it that way, that's fine. I mean, there's nothing yes. wrong with it. But most people would rather pray by themselves most of the time. So. That's good. Um, okay, a couple more questions. Um, with the busyness of life, y'all have always been extremely busy with, you know, ministry, work, family, grandkids. Um, how do you prioritize each other and your relationship so that you're still connecting every day, still talking every day, not neglecting one another? How do you prioritize your own relationship in the midst of all the work demands, ministry demands, family demands? Well, we kind of segment our time. You know, wherever we are, that's what we concentrate on. If we're at work, we concentrate on work. When we go home, we don't concentrate uh, on work, we concentrate on home. When the kids were, when you guys, you know, were, when it was, uh, when we were at home, we didn't talk about work. It was our home time that we shared. It was, uh, you know, so many times it concerns me these days that families don't have meals together at home. Because at home, every night with our meal, I would go home and I would cook. I would leave the office and I would cook. And at the mealtime is when we read our Bible, when we prayed, when we agreed on anything as a family, and when we talked. It was a time that, okay, guys, you know, whatever you want to talk about, we'll talk about. We did that for... That was until, before un, cell phones. Until the kids got to, they were, you know, high school driving and going and doing... We, we did 
do, we did things together as a family. In fact, we never, we never went out with other couples. We no. went with, a, we had family time because the rest of our time was with ministry. We had family time. Uh, we didn't have time to pursue other relationships. I, other I coached time. football and with Craig and they went to the game. She cheered lead and we went to their cheerleading. She did ballet and we went to her ballet recitals. Yes. The kids supported one another and what they do. And these, Craig and Denise have a strong relationship today. And I tell you, you better not, you better not cross his sis, his little sister or he's gonna come after you. I can tell you that right now. That, I've always... seen him do it before. But we, we did stuff together. We were together. Lynette and I, when we first got married, our first four years before we had any kids, we did, we did together. I mean, we had no money. And I was associate pastor. And we would go to North Park Mall and buy two, uh, two corn dogs and a Coke with two straws. And we would sit there and, and eat that and talk and I, we would walk around the mall and we would look at things and I'd tell her, I said, it's bad now, but if we do what God told us to do, if we follow him and do what he says, one of these days we can walk into any of these stores and buy anything we want to buy. And I thank God that, that, that I can today. It's not because of what I've done, it's because I followed him and he has blessed us. And I'll tell every one of you, if you as a couple will follow God with everything you got and everything you do, you, you'll come out on top. You're going, now, I'm not gonna tell you it's gonna be easy. There'll be some hard times, but I'll tell you what, when you get to the other end of the road, it's, it's nice, it's really nice. But it's, it's doing stuff together. If you want to keep the family together, then you do stuff together. You do stuff together. You support one another. We supported, I mean, Craig got into BMS bicycle racing. Okay, we, I get everything together and we go out there and I set it up and, and Denise is there, Lynette fixes sandwiches and stuff and I put the, the open the doors to the van and put up the little tent and put the green carpet out and get out all the seals. And he goes and rides the track and comes back. And he said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pedaling too much and not going anywhere. So we change the sprocket and go again. Here we go. And finally the dad started racing. And in fact, <laughs> we still got those bikes over there. I got a mongoose over and I was racing, I was racing with the dads and I come across one of those plateau deals and and man, I, I wiped out good. And that's the last time I rode. <laughs> so, not the bicycle, but the last time I rode in a bend. And then with her ballet, we with her in ballet, everything she did, we did it together. We supported one another. If mom was doing something, we supported her and what she did. If I was doing something, then they supported me and what I did. And, and then yeah. we, we, we rode. Craig and I started riding enduro motorcycles together and then finally Lynette said, well, listen, y'all are gone and me and Lynette and Denise are here and, she, and the three-wheelers come out. So we all started doing that. We did that for a long, in fact, these kids get together, they still talk about those times with the, with the three and four-wheelers. But it, it's, my most expensive bathroom I ever bought was a 31-foot motorhome. <laughs> 1977, I think it was. No, was it? No, it was 87, I guess. Anyway, or sometime back there. That's the most. Because she said, if we're gonna go do this, because we went up to a place and the motel was, you thought it was from the 1950s, and she said, no, if we're gonna do this, we're gonna do it right. So we had our. Well, I bought a motor home. <laughs> I do want to uh, give one example. I know, as in ministry, uh, it, it, there are busy times. And so there were times that, you know, we were in church a lot. And, uh, and so I, we would always say to the kids, look, you know, this, this, um, this week we're gonna be in church a lot. You're gonna be in church a lot. And, you know, just because we were in church late, it, 
it didn't affect them, guys. I, I honestly get really, okay, I'm gonna get on my soapbox. I get really upset at parents. Well, my child has to be in bed at seven o'clock so we can't come to church. That is hogwash. I'm gonna tell you what, you better have if your child If you're not honoring church. God, you, you're gonna be, you're gonna, it's gonna be a bad deal. But anyway, I always, it, because our life was church, I never wanted uh, our children to be bitter about God and about church because I had seen um, ministers' kids that had. And um, so I remember well, it was in 78, and um, I'm gonna cry, okay? But uh, Denise, I think was, I guess you were five, 73, you were five at the time. and. Um, he had been uh, gone for three weeks. He was gone um, overseas. To Africa. And to Africa. And so Denise is a chip off the old block and she was missing her dad. And so um, she was crying and I, I couldn't get her to stop. And I would, I never ever said, well, you know, I'm sorry, honey, because this is what God makes your dad do, you know, nothing like that. And, and, and you know, you, you just don't say those things. But at this, and I know that, knew that he didn't really want to be there that long, but that was the mission. And so I thought, oh, I've just got to, I've just got to call him. Well, I thought I had a phone number. Um, and I know it had to be an angel that hid this because I knew that that would not be good for him if he heard his daughter crying. And so at that moment, this is what God is so, you know, God will help you. If she had it. called me, I went and got on a plane, come home, forgot the mission. And so at this moment, I cried out to God and I said, God, I don't want my child to be bitter, you know, about her dad being gone and I don't know what to do. I'm... You know, I, I don't like it either, but that's just the way it is. So please, God, you've got to tell me how to, to comfort her. And so these were the words that came. And I said to her, I, said, I knew I needed Kleenex. And so um, Denise was always talking about heaven. And she was always talking about being a soul winner. She was a soul winner at five. She led her little a neighbor to God. And I said, Denise, remember how much you talk about heaven and when we all get to heaven? And she said, yeah. And I said, guess what? I said, we can't, Jesus can't come until the whole world has heard about him. And so that's what your daddy's doing right now. He's overseas telling people about Jesus. And so, you know, and when, and, and he'll be back soon. Well, you know what, that comfort her, she went to, to sleep and she said, oh, mommy, that's so great. I'm so glad he's over there. Never once again did she ever cry when her dad had to leave. Yeah, it's, it, there's one thing you gotta remember and I've always, did this, I, I watched my dad do it. God created family before he created ministry. And if you win the whole world and lose your own kids, you ain't done nothing. And so I always have been that way. I, 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 I watched him sacrifice, drive all night just to be, just to eat breakfast with us and then drive another 12 hours to start a meeting. And I, I used to, before the church started, we just had to school. I flew every weekend somewhere and preached every weekend. But I would coach football and I would go, and you could do it back then, I would go get on a red eye and I would fly, Lynette will tell you, I would fly all night, change clothes, put on a suit and tie to, at the airport, go preach, and I rest a little bit that afternoon, preach, get on a red eye and fly back to Tulsa and be here in the morning time to, to go to Rama and teach at Rama and that, then I was, I was it. I was, that was all Rama was, me. And, uh, and not one time, I'd go home in the afternoon, Craig says, I want to throw the football. Not one time to ever say, I'm too tired. I'll go outside, i throw football, i throw baseball. I, not one time she ever said, Dad, I want to go do this or that, that I said, no, I'm too tired. Was, was, 
it was, it was a sacrifice, yeah. I would have rather just sat down and done nothing. But you see, if you, want, if, you want to, if you want to have a great marriage and have a great family, then you, you sacrifice for one another. And I mean, that's just the way I've done it and it's worked. That's beautiful. 54 years of marriage right here. And I think that sums it up loving one another, sacrificing for one another, and putting each other first. Yes. I remember one time I had flown back and Denise didn't think I was gonna get there. She had some kind of uh, deal. An event. An event she was having at school, I think. I know it was at school, I don't know what it was anyway. And I got her roses and made it to the auditorium and when it was over, I went up, the other dads were going up and giving, I went up and I never will forget the look on her face when she saw me coming down the aisle with those, with those roses and, and it, 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 it wiped away all the tiredness and all the, <laughs> you know, but you do, if you learn how to do that with your wife, with your family, you, you, you'll, have a, you'll have a great life. Well, I can honestly say that they have been amazing examples um, of what a great marriage should be as well as what amazing parents should and be. And when you get grandkids, I give to those grandkids just like I gave to them. I, I've been it. I, <clears throat> in fact, when Wesley was the last one and he went from the, to the eighth grade to so then school ball, I woke up that Saturday morning and I told Annette, I said, I don't know what to do with myself. This is the first time since Cameron started playing ball when he was five years old, six years old. And now Wesley has gone to school ball. This is the first time in all of those years that I hadn't had at least one or two ball games to go to on a Saturday. There was one time and Craig was with me on this. His three boys were playing in Indian Springs. Cameron was at this field. Blake was at this field. Skyler was at this field. And I'm running between the three fields, trying to get to each one when they come up to bat so I could see them bat or see Blake was pitching and watch him pitch. And I did it with Trevor. I did it with Wesley. I did it with all of them. I went to every football game, every baseball game, every basketball game that I possibly could get to with those boys. And, and it, I think it paid off because they all, they all love their poppy. And they, uh, Definitely our poppy's boys for sure. Yes. Well, we need to go ahead and get out of here. I just want to say thank you so much for just being transparent and open and honest and sharing a piece of your life and a piece of your heart with us. We appreciate it very I, much. I trust, I trust it helped somebody. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. you know, thank you. <laughs> Pastor, do you want to uh, just close us out with a word of prayer, maybe for the marriages here and for the families here? Yes. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you're the one that institute marriage in the first place. And I thank you, Father, today that as individuals embark upon their marriage life together and those that have already embarked, I thank you that the Spirit of God will be with them I thank you that they will know how to have and work with one another to have a good marriage. I thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen.